method of um, um, is our method of communication. We're also joined by the head of our education team, um, Emily Genoway. Hi, everybody. So at this point, I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to Cindy. I'm going to start my recording here. And all right, Cindy, you can take it Great. away. Um, so as Kara said, I'm Cindy Harley, and I'm an associate professor at Metropolitan State University. When I was hired, I was hired there to start teaching A&P because they had this nursing program and they were basically only getting A&P through the community colleges. We wanted to be able to teach it locally. So um, round about my second year of teaching A&P, I, I got this hysterical call from my sister who late in life decided to go back to physical therapy school for physical therapy and she said you've got to check this app out it's it's called visible body it's super cool it's got everything in there you got to recommend it to your students and so I was like okay that sounds like fun and I started looking at it and I really liked it and I was having a lot of fun playing with it and then as I got students that were kind of struggling struggling I'd say, hey, there's this app, it's not that expensive, you can buy it. This is before courseware existed. Um, and kind of referred students to that. And the improvement that I saw in these students was nothing short of miraculous. They would go from having Ds to getting Bs. And it was really, really, really telling. And I thought, okay, why is this working? And I'm, I'm still not 100% sure, but my working, my working idea is that we're speaking to them in their language that these uh, students have been kind of raised on tech and we're giving them something that speaks to their sensibility and something that they know um, they they know how to navigate it kind of capitalizes on their natural curiosities with with how it works um, so i ended up using it and it's been uh now a couple years um so we were a beta test site for courseware and then um I wrote the sample a and courses for courseware, so um, those are in there, and that's still very much what we use. We've kind of, I think, even pruned it back a little bit from, from the sample courses. Um, it's a little lighter mode now, but um, we still use it. We love it. I have been setting things up in modules, which is what you'll see um, if you end up in courseware, that each body system is a module. And then within that module, the students have a couple things to do. This got changed a little bit with COVID. And what I started doing was really capitalizing on the modular organization, but then adding in a little video instruction for each part of the module so that the students would have a video of me talking and then they had a couple things they could work through and then they'd have a quiz. And the quizzing was done through courseware, which is great because then you can kind of offload a lot of the grading. And that's good because if you are recording lectures, you're putting that effort up front, so you kind of get it back in the end. Um, my students have really loved this, um, and I, I've never been one that's been able to pull off what's called a flipped classroom, um, but I say we do a lean. So the students come in and they come in having done some of this and then we talk a little bit more about the material, but it becomes more of a discussion and less of a lecture. And that's a little more fun for me. It's a little more comfortable. And a lot of times the students, which I work with um, primarily adult students and returning students and uh, English language learners, they are able to bring in questions and stories of their life and it allows them to do that and that's really wonderful especially when you're dealing with um, people interested in healthcare. Um, so one of my or i've got a couple i guess it's hard to narrow, narrow it down one favorite thing um, one of the things that sort of solidified our switch to visible body we were, were using a standard textbook and the a p textbooks are expensive um, I mean, I guess if you're using OpenStax, it's not bad, but the normal textbooks are $120 to $200, and they usually have some sort of online thing they want you to pay for. And my students can't afford that. So it was really exciting to see something that was $50 that they could use for multiple semesters. And that's even, you know, if they fail the course, they don't have to repay for it, which is something that you do need to keep in mind with A&P because about 30% of your students will fail. Um, that said, since we switched to Visible Body, our 
DFW rate, so D's fails and withdraws, dropped from being around 35% to now we see on average under 20%. So we've had a significant drop in DFs and Ws. Um, and if you take out one just horrid semester I had, we're right around about 16% DFW um, as our norm. Sometimes it's really low. With COVID, I was expecting a lot of withdrawals. I had none. And I had, I think, two students in a class of 24 fail. So really low failure rate this semester, even with the, the scenario that was going on, which was really incredible to me. The students have loved it. Um, they mention it at, um, I looked through my course evaluations today and it's going, we don't get as many mentions as we got in the beginning. The first three semesters we used visible body, 40% of the students made positive comments about it in their course eval. So they'd say, I love visible body. Or you'd say, one of the questions is about um, favorite things about the course and they'd say visible body. So it always shows up there. Um, I'm not seeing it as much anymore, but I think it's because they, they see it in the first semester. So I suspect, suspect that the first semester instructor seeing that and I'm teaching predominantly the second. So now they know how to use it. They're a well-oiled machine. They do still mention it. It's just now I'm down to maybe 15 to 20% of the students saying visible body is awesome. Um, and the one of the things about using this product um, that I love is it's changed my teaching style. I don't PowerPoint anymore. Um, I pull up the visible body models and we talk as we go through it. And usually I accompany that if I'm in the classroom with a whiteboard and we'll, we'll diagram the structures. When it was remote, we would go through the structures um, using the visible body models. And then as a class, we would go through it again on a digital whiteboard and the students Absolutely um, loved that. I think it's a little bit more organic, a little more interesting way to teach. And um, the transition to distance for us, because we had this platform already working, was um, really easy. Oh, so I got a question from the, the chat window about the new DFW percentage. Right now, it's a uh, what is it? It's 20, it's right, right around 20%. Um, but that includes one really, 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 really bad semester that I had. Um, and if you take that one out, it drops down to about 16% DFW, which is far below the national average. Um, so I think that the students feel better supported with this material. They have the quizzes, they practice. When you talk to them about it, they talk about it as playing. And they absolutely love these apps. Um, and then making labs with the apps, whether you're making your own or you're using the labs that already exist is really easy. So when we had to switch to online, it was a pretty easy switch for us. And I contacted the AMP1 instructor just to check in because um, she's a, she and I work together and I said, how are you doing? Are you worried? And she said, no, I've got physical body. I'm fine. So so it's, the, the transition to online hasn't been as abrupt and scary. Um, so everything I've told you so far is for um, anatomy and physiology. I do teach comparative physiology as well. And there I use, um, I use visible body in class as the instructor. I don't have the students buy it. They actually buy a comparative physiology textbook. Um, that said, the new pathophysiology app is excellent, and it's one that I've been, um, when I, I'm sort of going to revise comparative a little bit, and that might be something that, that they end up buying. Um, I've been trying to kind of keep the costs down in all my courses because it does create an accessibility issue. Um, so for comparative physiology, I don't know how many comparative people we have out there. Uh, we... I, I have gone through, I think, eight different textbooks or nine different textbooks to find the best one. And right now I use Moyes and Schultz, which I like. It's not great. Okay. I've been really wanting Visible Body to make a comparative app. That said, when you do teach comparative, if you can get the students to understand the systems, 
and how they work in us, then you can kind of pull it out to comparative. So when, I, when I'm teaching comparative, I'll show these models and the students get super excited about it. And then they'll say, okay, what's that app? And the ones that struggle often will buy the app because it, it helps them. Um, if I was teaching anatomy only, I would still use courseware. Looking at that question, um, I would say if, if I could pick anatomy or physiology, which one visible body does better, currently the anatomy is, is done better than the physiology, um, you could do it in a couple different ways. You could use Atlas, which is fully anatomy, or if you use the A&P app, um, it, still, it still has a lot of anatomy in it. We joke, we joke about big A, little P, or big P, little A when we're talking about our courses. Um, and I'm, I'm always saying I'm, I'm a physiologist, so I always want it to be the most physiology as possible. Um, for me, having an anatomy heavy software is actually really cool because I can add the physiology in. Um, but that said, now the physiology, every, every update, they add more physiology. <laughs> um, so what I would say, let's see, uh, there's a, oh, a question about instructor copies. So um, it turns out currently courseware is, uh, there's a trial period and it's open till Kara, is it June? June 30th. So open till June 30th. Um, and you can kind of look at it and see if it's something you'd be interested in. Um, I will say as an instructor, just getting the apps and having those to do lectures with has been amazing because now you've got basically a cadaver on any device and you can pull it up and you can show the students and be like, okay, we're gonna dissect this down. And one of the things I love teaching with the apps is when you're looking at hepatic portal system and why you don't have it in the arteries, we can actually have the students really look at that and diagram it out. And you can do some really, really, really cool, um, some active learning exercises where you have them kind of map structures and the pathway of something. Um, and I, I find that to be a lot of fun. And the students, they, they get really engaged with it. And the cool thing is it fits on their phone so they can take it anywhere. Um, so I had a, my, my first student that ever used visible body was a boiler maintenance guy. And he's, he would drain the boilers and he'd have to like sit there for an hour while his boiler was draining. And he's like, well, this is great. Now I have my phone and I can just use the app on my phone. So I think it's fantastic. Um, oh my goodness, we have so many questions. Yeah, do you want me to read them off to you, Cindy? Do you, you <laughs> I'm trying to kind of hit them as I go. Um, there we go. So there's one about um, LMS integration. So Emily can tell you more about that. I, um, so I work for state of Minnesota and the state would not allow it which was maddening and really strange at first. And that's kind of how we became this courseware beta test site is that there were other institutions in the same boat. Um, and having the students navigate two systems can be a little trying, but what I figured out is if you make a checklist for them on your learning management system, we use D2L, they can just check off what they've done and then they'll know, oh, I've got to go check in with courseware. So it's, it's not terrible um, if you end up in that boat. Um, I don't know, Emily, if you wanna talk about LMS integration. Sure, sure. So um, we are actually working on it right now. We, what we have now is a light integration. So um, you can export the grades into a CSV that's ready to upload into your LMS. Um, and you can actually link directly to Visible Body Courseware assignments using the assignment link. And I can show you that in a few minutes if you want. Um, but yes, we, we know the need is high for deep integration, which has the single sign on. So um, we should have something, I would say, in the next few months. So if that's really important to you, definitely we'll connect you with your Visible Body rep and they'll keep you updated on, on the progress there. Yeah, and I will say you can download your grade book. Your, um, so Courseware is a separate, separate website. You can download your Courseware grade book and you can um, 
upload that into, at least I've been able to upload it into D2L, although usually I'm, I'm a little old school. I like to enter my own grades just because I'm afraid of making mistakes. <laughs> um, somehow, I don't know why I trust the computer less than me. It's usually better, but um, so there, there are ways to do it. I think um, it's not as cumbersome as you might, you might worry. Um, so let's see. I'm yeah, back up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, um, yeah, you can continue to post the questions in the chat and we, you can also raise your hand. Um, Kara can unmute you and, you know, that way you can ask your question live and have a little, uh, dialogue with each other, which would be really nice. So sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to unmute you, um, uh, Sophia. I'm allowing you to, I hope I said your name right. I'm going to unmute you now. So you should be, you may have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think I do. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. All right. Um, hi, thank you so hi. much. <laughs> uh, so um, since you mentioned, Cindy, that uh, you do not have PowerPoints, uh, I mean, not like right now, you probably did in the beginning. So at the moment, how do you deal with those concerns and questions about uh, like, what are the learning goals for the students? Uh, which they, they, they will typically ask, what do I need to know, right? So what I thought, that, <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. And this was, this was the fear, right? Like switching, going PowerPoint free is not for the faint of heart. What I want to do, can I show you the course in courseware? Uh, I kind of, uploaded, uh, yeah, I got one of your courses, like the one, right. the A and P one, uh, and I, so, yeah. Let me, um, whoops, here, we'll move that. Um, so at the beginning of each of these modules, there is a document, and it's a Word document, so you can edit mm -hmm. it, right? Because as an instructor, using someone else's stuff is not the most um, comfortable for us, right? Um, so, oh, there we go. If you look at this, um, these guided notes, oh, pff, of course, I'm, I'm doing two desk, or uh, what do they call it, dual screening, and of course, it popped up on the other screen. Um, these have what I would consider my learning objectives. So it kind of walks the students through the big ideas, what units should you be using, and then um, some very, ba what I consider kind of like the basic questions. So this is a document that I would create if I was making a PowerPoint, and it's there. So if you want a PowerPoint, that's cool. What I do right now is I keep these with me, and I'll have my notes, and I'll just go through the lecture, like the story. And um, I shouldn't have opened the sensory one. I'm a sensory system person, so the sensory one, I'd say, is, is probably the bulkiest of them. Yeah. But um, so what I do is I kind of go through these with the students, and we talk about answers to the questions as I go through. And then one thing the students will do is they'll say, oh, wait, um, are the receptors sense specific? I didn't catch that one, or, you know, whatever the question happens to be, and then we can go through that part. Um, these questions in these uh, guided notes are not all answered through the app because very genuinely they're from my, my lectures. Um, so there's some supplement stuff in there. Um, like the, the pregnant woman question, I have a lot of moms in the class and they always wonder about that. And so we spend, we spend time talking about pregnant ladies. It's awesome. Um, so that's there. And I think, you know, if you wanted to go PowerPoint free, it will give you the support I give it to the students and I think it gives them support and then they stop asking me for study guides. They just say, oh, well, the guide's already in the course and they're, they're um, completely interested in it. So it works, I think it works pretty well, um, but of course I'm biased. Every now and then you do have students that are like, I want a PowerPoint that I can memorize and I'd feel better about that and that's just not, that's not my goal. I don't want them to memorize a PowerPoint, right? I want them to understand. So, um, did that answer your question, Sophia? Yeah, that's perfect. Yes, it takes some courage from both sides, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, it is. As an instructor, you know, those PowerPoint slides, those are your cue cards. <laughs> and so the first time you walk in a classroom and you don't have them, you're like, what am I going to do? But once you get rid of them, there's, 
I, I find it more comfortable and I find that I'm more actively engaged because if there's writing on a screen, I'm going to read the writing, even if I know what it says. And that's my natural thing. So I kept getting these student comments that were, she just reads her slides. And I'm like, I don't read my slides, but I'm, believe it or not, a very shy person. And when I see text, I just, I turn towards it. And so even when I give um, research seminars, I try to avoid text because otherwise I'll read it. Um, so this gives me a way to kind of have cue cards and little notes to myself that I can go through. Um, so I make sure I hit on the big points and then it's also like this living document. So with COVID, there were a couple things that I just was like, we're not covering it this year. So I did strike through on your document. So you know that it was there. And if you want to learn that on your own, you can, but you're not required by me. Oh, yeah, that's, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, no if I can ask a follow-up question. Of course. I will do it now. Yeah, it's related to uh, kind of, transition in like I, I will use visible body in the summer semester which starts next week <laughs> and I'm wondering I don't want to make a huge of a transition and yes I am doing powerpoints now and I'm annotating them and so like what do you suggest that the minimal less invasive less stressful transition would be and how can I make the most out of visible body so without you know, if I was everything? teaching in the summer and had like no time. What I would do is go through your slides and write in the corner what mm -hmm. part of the of um, the app. I tend to use A and P a lot because it's well, it's A and P. And I'll, um, someone asked to show that one, so we're going to kill two birds with one stone here. Um, I am showing it on my phone, so it may look a little bit weird. We'll see. But what I would do is on your slide put the chapter designator for what your teaching corresponds to. So let's pretend that you're talking about the different types of cells. Well, then you'd say mm -hmm. 1.3 and you'd show okay. the students that. And what that will do is it allow them to look it up. And then when you're making modules or if you use the pre-existing course, just make sure it has those things in it. We don't mm -hmm. always cover all the same things as each other, right? Because because yeah. we don't. Um, and that will sort of allow the students to know where you are. Um, one of the first labs I always do is one that walks them through visible body. So um, this is how you do these things and they have to like draw on a model. So um, I'm gonna pull up one of the 3D models because this is really what makes visible body visible body. So you've got this text here. And the thing I love about the text is it's minimalistic. Um, I find a lot of textbooks to be very bloated. And there are a bunch of terms down here. So here's plasma membrane. And when I click on that, the plasma membrane is highlighted. When I click on cytosol, the cytosol is highlighted, right? Um, but I can also just play with the model and I can be like, what's this thing right here? And I click on it and it's the peri pericentral, I can't say that today. We're just gonna say it's Monday, whoops. And you guys are seeing an email. Sorry about that. Um, so it will show them these things. And let's pretend that your students are like mine. They're language learners. And or they're like me today. And they're, they're like, how do I say that? If you push the little speaker icon, it says the word. And if you want to learn more about it and you click the book icon, it gives you all kinds of information about this structure. So let's say that your instructor is giving you notes. Well, you can actually write notes on things. So you can be like, this is, and I'm doing this with my finger on my phone. Um, but I can write like, this is the gold, gold G. Whoops. Okay. It's way easier on the iPad for me because I've got, I've got really big hands. <laughs> um, so you can write notes of things. Sometimes, um, like if I'm doing a lecture, I usually do the second semester of a &P, um, because our adjunct that also teaches a &P really, really, really loves, um, she's, she's a bone person. And so she does, she does all the bones. But let's pretend that you're talking about heart. And you can say, you can talk about the different structures and then you can say, all right, let's talk about the blood flow. Well, the blood's gonna come through the superior vena cava. It's gonna go through this atrium, into the ventricle, 
Now it's going to pump out and you can actually draw this on the app. The students can do this too and they can take notes and they can save those notes. And one thing I do for my students is I take screenshots of the organs so that they'll have those screenshots and they can then use the screenshots to like write handwritten notes on. Um, so they can save this to their photos, they can save it as a favorite. Um, I've been trying to get mine to, to send images to each other and quiz each other. So I've got this whole idea of using Snapchat as a quiz function so that I can like send out a thing and be like, tell me what it is and they only get 30 seconds to look at it. Um, but it's, it's a really, really interesting software. They can even email views to each other, um, which is great. And this is just the a and app. So the reason I'm showing you this one is to me, this is what I use as a textbook. Um, wacky as it sounds. It's got a bunch of units through here that go through different parts of the anatomy and physiology. There's also, and this is one of my favorite functions, I know it sounds really weird, but they've got this checklist. And that's the learning objectives. And the student can be like, oh, I can identify this stuff. They check it off and they say, but how do gases go between the bloodstream and, and the lungs? And they click on this right here and it takes them to something about that. So it kind of helps them to get to where their questions might be. Embedded in all of this with these, the 3D models, their practice quizzes, um, there are also videos and the videos are, I think the longest one is around like two and a half, three minutes. They're very short. And sometimes the students like to watch those like multiple times and really get it down. What I do when I'm lecturing virtually is I'll sometimes voice over the video myself or I'll have, you know, a structure and I'll be rotating the structure and dissecting it while I'm talking and pointing out things. And I can, you know, like highlight the diaphragm here and then I'd start talking to you about the diaphragm, for example. Um, so to get up and running with it quick, what I would do is I'd start with, I'd start with a pre-made course and I would look at your lecture slides, figure out what they correspond to, write those numbers in like the lower corner of the slide for the students so they know where they need to go. And then if there's something that you don't refer to, you can cut it out of the guided notes and cut it out of that, that, um, that lecture module so that they don't have extra stuff to go through. One thing I've done over time is I've switched my courseware. Um, oh, here, let me pop that over here and then we'll answer more questions in just a minute. Um, I've switched mine a little bit and I've made it into, I've had this interest in this flipped classroom and I've never been able to do one like successfully. I've never gotten it to go. But now I joke that we lean. So what I do is I have switched my units and I've made them more like, what do I want the students to know before they come in the classroom that day? So this is one on taste. Um, so how is information transduced into, into a neural signal, identify the pathway, and then label the structures. And we can kind of just go through and it's like four little models that they can rotate around and look at. Um, and to give you one that's not sensory, we can go into digestion. Um, and this particular one is just talk about peristalsis and locate the structures of the esophagus and stomach. And so it's just these three little things that they can go through and kind of, it, it's each module or each little bit is not that much. And it's because I'm envisioning you know, student lives in general is being very interrupted. And I'm sort of embodying the fact that our attention span is normally about 15 minutes. And so I'm trying to give 15 minute chunks. Um, all right. We have a couple of questions coming in, Cindy. Do you want me yeah, to I, talk to you and you can kind of see, see between you and Emily uh, who wants sure. to address? So um, Joan is asking, would visible body work well for one semester non-majors A and P, or is it more geared toward two semester pre-allied health? So I've taught human, human bio, which is that one semester course, and I've used it in that course. They're not going to use it to the full extent, but at the same time, if you're looking at 
it, it's going to save them one a lot of money. Um, and two, what I would do in that case is your your modules that you assign are just going to be smaller. Um, I think that the cool thing about it is you can go into as much or as little detail as you want. If you really want to put an anatomical model in there and really have them like dig through it, you can. Like say you're in a 300 level course, um, but if you're in a 100 level non-majors, I think having them watch some of those videos and do a couple of the activities, they're going to be um, more than prepared. And then usually when I teach that course, I pair it with um, some free simulations from like uh, University of Colorado FET or Bioman Bio, which is like a video game site. And I have them do a couple simulations just to, to up the their understanding of the physiology a little bit. So I think it works fine. Um, I used it with what do they call that book? It's something like a visual analogy guide to physiology or something. And that was the textbook I used when I taught that course. So, um, but I think you could just make it with visible body. The students loved it. Okay, um, Sandra had a question. Sandra, I'm gonna um, unmute you so you can ask your question. You may have to unmute yourself on your end too. Ah, there we go, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I noticed that you were writing on the um, the heart um, as well as the cell, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering. Um, I, I'm still, you know, navigating the the courseware and all of the apps. Um, is there an area where instead of writing, because sometimes I could see where that might be very um, troublesome for some of my students who need everything to everything to be really neat. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I'm, is there like a, an option to add labels? So let's yes. say, yeah, because that would be, um, I've actually been doing a lot of flipped classroom, sort of modified or leaning, as you had said, um, classroom with my students where they receive a lot of instruction, where I'm creating these um, videos. And I've been really wanting them to, instead of me just telling them all about the, the um, structures and having them memorize images, um, I want them to now find the images and label if I give them sort of a list. But it's helpful yeah. with an app like this because if you click on the image, it'll obviously give you the name and then just go in and sort of label. And I figured they mm -hmm. could do a screenshot as their evidence for finding the information. So where, let me show you that. It's in, it's in Atlas. Okay. Um, and there's something cool that I want to talk about that you can do with the labeling function. But if you go, you can see where it says add a tag. It's just under all those pictures of related organs. When I click that, it adds a tag. And so here I tagged the omentum. And you'll notice the tag kind of follows it as I rotate it, which is really cool. When you draw an atlas, the drawing will also rotate. Kind of fun. So what's something fun that you can do with this? Well, you can cover those tags with blanks. And now you've made a quiz. Yes. And so this is something you can do for handouts, right? And it's super easy. Like making, I always joke with my students because when, when they get quizzed on where anatomy is and they get some sort of sheet to fill out, I always say, you got to know your uterus from your uvula because I'm going to give you your whole body, right? <laughs> and they, they get the whole thing and they have to find the structures and it'll have spots for labels, but they have to do it. And so like when we do circulatory, that's what we do. Um, so if we get rid of this structure, there's, I can click fade and so I can just see what's behind it or I can click hide. And by the way, again, I'm doing this on my phone. So it's a little clunky right now. It's, it's much easier when you've got the iPad, it's a nice big screen and everything has spread out. Right. Um, so now you're on an itty bitty little iPhone that's on my computer. But so now I've got, um, access to the intestines and I can say, oh, well, let's, you know, look at the jejunum or let's take it out, right? And see what's behind it. And then they can dissect that. Now, this is a very pared down, pared down view. Right now I'm looking, um, this is Atlas. And Atlas, you can split it up into regions. You can split it up into systems, which is how I normally do it. Or you can do a gross anatomy lab. And this, you can even do any of these in VR so they can project them. I don't use that as much when I teach, but I do use it to freak people out in bars. So when 
what you can do is literally have this cadaver on a slab and then the student can dissect through it or if they're in AR mode they can move their device and in moving their device it'll section through it so I imagine if you were teaching like sectional anatomy you could really do something cool with that um, and they can just use a scalpel tool and literally cut things away on this person and try to find something one of my thoughts for online integration and it's something I did not do is that um, you could use something like VoiceThread or some other vi video sharing software. I mean, heck, even TikTok, right? And have the students do this kind of dissection and go down to the structure that you're looking for. So you could assign a different thing to each student mm -hmm. and say, okay, you're gonna find me the serratus muscle. You're gonna find me the, um, whatever, the, the trapezius, you know, whatever it happens to be, and have each student do a different piece of the puzzle. Okay. Okay. And I think that could be a super fun digital assignment. And this is where, too, I think you could, like, um, if I get rid of my scalpel and I just highlight something, um, I could highlight this muscle and send them a picture and say, tell me what it is. Right. Um, this is also where sometimes the students will get goofy. So if you're walking around the classroom, when when we can do that again, um, you'll look over and you'll see that they've drawn pictures. And so a lot of times if it's the skeleton, they'll draw like big googly eyes in them and stuff. But I, I think it's great. I love to see them playing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the real learning happens. Um, there's another function. I Well, actually, there are a couple functions I didn't talk about. There's a stethoscope, and we use this a lot too. So the stethoscope gives you common health ailments. And one thing I have my students do is um, they have to write about a health ailment. So um, I'm typically doing uh, organ systems, but they may have to write something about, and I'll, I'll put some sort of bound on it and be like, okay, I want you to write about a digestive ailment. And they'll use that stethoscope and they'll come up with something really cool and then they'll talk about it and we have a format where they have to talk about it to a layperson. So you can make a pamphlet for a clinic, you can write a letter to a loved one, you can write a poem um, or make a cartoon or something, but it has to have all these elements of telling you why this ailment does what it does. Um, there's also, if you're doing muscles, you can highlight origins and insertions and that kind of stuff too. That's pretty easy. Um, one of my favorite buttons, because physiology geek, um, I like the microanatomy a lot because now we can actually look at an alveolus and see what's in an alveolus. And I can talk to the students and say, oh, do you notice how thin those cells are? Why do you think that would be? And I can actually turn it into sort of an inquiry-based lecture. Um, there's, I know a lot of us hate dealing with nephrons, right? They have a hard time with the nephron, but now they can go through it and they can click on the different parts of the nephron. They can whoops, um, see it in a kidney. They can zoom into it. Um, and it just, it, it sort of speaks to them in a better way and it kind of capitalizes on their their curiosity, because what'll happen is they'll see something, they'll be like, oh, what's this new by structure? And then they'll click on it and they'll learn about it rather than waiting 10 pages for the book to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like this one. There's also muscle actions. So if you're teaching muscle, these are really fun. So you can actually see which muscles are shortening. Um, and it'll have, it it has related movements which is kind of cool and what else is in here oh and there are videos so videos of the different kinds of joints videos of cells and tissues tissue repair um, if you're in courseware you'll also get the the animations that are pathology related which are great and um, I don't know I just I, I find that to be a lot of fun. 
Um, and one thing you will notice is my background here, as I pull it up is black, you can totally change that to white if you don't like the black. I, I go between the two. Um, but this is a neat one. And then uh, Emily is, Pathophys is gonna be offered in courseware. When, when does that one open up? Soon. So this summer, it should be in courseware. So that is my ultimate favorite app right now because one of the things they have is they have a beating, like the, well, the one I'm most familiar with, they have a beating heart and it's got, you can pull up the ECG, you can pull up the, um, the you can look at the blood flow through it, you can look at how the muscle is moving, and you can do all of this in 3D. You can look at when the valves are opening and closing. So you could have your students reconstruct a Wigger diagram using this thing. And there's something about that that I find so cool and so powerful. Um, and then it's also got, you know, breathing and kidneys and all sorts of other stuff. But I'm, I'm kind of in love with the heart on that one. I think it's just really, really, really beautiful. Um, and, it's going to be a lot of fun to teach with. Yeah, well, we can take a preview in a few minutes. I'll get my iPad all set up. Um, I can show the beating heart if you want to take another question. Sure. Oh, definitely. I'm going to go ahead and unmute a couple more folks here to ask their question. Um, looks like Anoka Ramsey College and Ola, Ola Tunde. I might be saying your name wrong. I apologize. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you both. So you're welcome to ask your, you may have to unmute yourself on your end as well. Hi, uh, I'm Paula Grunque, sorry. That's the name of our college. I don't know how I sign in. Okay. Um, <laughs> I apologize. I have a couple of questions. Um, can you show uh, just a bone? Uh, one of the things that I found out last semester with my students in the city situation is that I had two 16 year olds doing exactly what this app allows you to do online with Snapchat. They were grabbing the actual bones on, in, during lab and as I was going in the big camera demo, where I was showing all the bone markings, they were literally labeling in Snapchat every little bone marking that I was going, for example, in the ulna that they needed to know for the exam. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my question is, um, instead of adding the automatic tags that might not have all the bone markings, or they might have different bone markings of what we require them to know, because we have standardized labs, we teach a lot of yeah. sexual things. Um, I love the feature that they can write on it, um, like you did. Can you show me the detail of a bone and how much they can rotate it and would be able to generate, let's say, an image? Can they Snapchat, uh, I mean, label all the bone and then make a screenshot and send it to me as an assignment, for example, so that I know they found oh, everything? Absolutely, and I would recommend doing an assignment like that where you have them sort of sending you screen screenshots and things because it does, it does give you an idea if they are able to do what you want them to do. And for them, sometimes the app is, they, they get a little scared by it. And then they, I always tell them like, look, you can use whatever textbook you want to get this information. They have correlation guides. So if you want to use a textbook, you still can. Mm -hmm. um, and the correlation guide will say like this part of the app corresponds to this chapter. I tell the students, you can use any book you want. Whatever you got, you can use it. You don't have to. And, um, you know, then just make sure they know how to use the app. And usually they stop using their book because <laughs> they like the app. So I'm going to show you what is in Atlas. Um, all the apps are a little bit different in what's in them. And the cool thing about courseware is it's not prescribed. You can like pick and choose whatever your favorite thing is. But this is the section femur. And this one's got um the um it's got a periosteum on it on it it's actually got um articular cartilage on it um you can go into the spongy bone you can you know look at the marrow um and then if you want to go further with your bone layers they've got a bone that's just kind of chopped so you can say okay what's the difference between that spongy bone and that that um cancellous bone and then they've got just an osteon and so the students whoa sorry that happens sometimes 
they can zoom into this osteon and they can kind of look at it and say, oh, well, there are like blood vessels going through it and they can get a sense of it. Um, if you are in the A&P app, that one, uh, let's see if I can find it. As you're going through the bone, one of the cool things is it also has um, histology images. So I know some people love to teach a lot of histo. And so you actually have these histology slides and you can go through the histology slides and well, what's the difference between, um, we've been looking at spongy bone, now we've got cancellous bone. So what's the difference between these two things and, and um, how are they different? Right, so that's kind of fun too, that you can, you can play with the tissue types. Let's go back, um, let's see. And they do have, you know, a labeled one, but if you wanted the students to write, what I would do is just, you know, give them this femur. And now they can write on it and they can put in the, the detail that they, you know, that they want to put in there. Um, and they can get as fancy with it as, as they like. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Yes, it, it kind of did. Um, I, the other question that I have is more for Emily, I think. Um, we, thanks to an amazing colleague that actually worked the grant and all that, we purchased this space and we started using it last, um, these last two semesters. And obviously we cannot do that online. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping to be able to talk to the rep to see if there's something that we can do um, just temporarily with COVID. Um, yeah. to, because we have body bees. Um, I think we have visible body capability. We just cannot use those laptops that, in which they look at all the 3D stuff. So exactly. I, yeah. We, you know, we came up with a way for students to log in using a remote desktop. Um, I had the same problem in one of my classes. I was using Symbio okay. and they could not, the, the student, I had a couple of students who were like, I've got a Chromebook. The nice thing if you do switch to visible body is that it works on the internet. They can have the app um, and the app works on, um, it can, I, uh, let's see. It for sure works on the Mac and the iPad and a Windows desktop. I was just thinking about Chromebooks. Does do you guys does it work on a Chromebook? It depends on the Chromebook. It does. Of course, where it does work on most Chromebooks. Um, yeah, and yeah, and so and from any pretty much any computer, um, courseware will work through internet. And Cindy's right. Yeah, the the mobile apps are with courseware. Students get um, all four visible body apps and uh, coming soon five of them um, that they own and those they download onto whatever mobile device they have. So we work across um, Apple devices and Android. So phones and tablets. Yeah, so it's, it's nice because I haven't had a lot of problems with student access. Um, I have had some that are like I used, I used the Burger King uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> to do my homework and that happens that's okay but that's you know if they've got the online homework if they're doing it at home and it's on, it, once it's on their device they can use it and I haven't had too much of a problem in fact I had one student whose mom saw the app and loved it so much that she went out one bought herself a copy and two bought her daughter an iPad which was kind of cool um, and they, you know, the student, student loved it, of course. So, you know, it's, it's nice, I think, just because the, the cost is down um, from a lot of those softwares. And it also kind of walks them through, like, this is what you have to do, which it, my, my drawback when I look at a lot of the 3D softwares that exist right now, you open it up and you're like, okay, what do I do? And for me, I can say, oh, well, you look at this chapter and it, it's sort of this thing that will walk them through a series of events that makes some amount of sense. All right. Questions from uh, Mitra. Sure. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can find you to unmute you so you can go ahead and talk to 
Okay, there you go. I found you. So you are now unmuted. You might have to unmute yourself on your end as well. And then you can ask your questions live. Hi, Dr. Hi. 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 Uh, okay, so I have a question in regards to the references you choose uh, Invisible Body. Um, is it just uh, from one uh, reference like Maryab or you choose from other references as well? Oh, I, I'm not sure that I'm understanding your questions. Do you mean in the, the text, in the, the text, text, in the actual textbook? Document? Yeah, the textbook. Yeah. The oh, textbook. so for for a text, I just use Visible Body for the textbook. I don't even use a textbook anymore. Okay. Um, so I just use the text that's within the app and then kind of assume that students will be able to um, they're, they're able to use another textbook. There is this, uh, they call it a correlation guide, and it kind of tells you what visible body things correspond to what things in a textbook, but my students don't really feel like they need a textbook, which is great. Um, and I've been finding more and more, a lot of them like video. And so what I've started doing is making my own, making my own videos and getting the students to look at those. Um, so I have a YouTube channel now. It's a little scary, but it's a lot of fun um, to just kind of work with them on that. So it doesn't come with an uh, e-book, uh, your, uh, the resources. It just, uh, I, I was wondering if, if there's a specific reference. I mean, the e-book uh, e uh, you are using. Um, so that's what, what I'm using is just what's in there within their software, but it looks like um, Emily's pulling up the correlations and you can use any book. Okay. Like they're, they're all on there. They are. Um, we have many more beyond this. We have a huge list of courses. So, and like Cindy said earlier, that's the, the best way to get started is to, to pick one of the pre-built courses and you know, all the visible body content will be put in the order of the book. So it's a nice, you don't really, you don't have to change your syllabus. So it's a lot less work for you. So you can see we've got lab manual correlations. We also have some standard courses um, that are not correlated to books, but we do have a ton of courses already built and a lot of textbook correlations. Um, yeah, you can see them here. So we've got Marifold. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, um, another question is in regard to the resources for uh, both lectures and lab. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you separate these uh, uh, sections um, for the students? I mean, for, for example, doing the homework, the homework assignment, uh, do they have a separate sections for lecture and lab? So my course is integrated. Um, and since it is an integrated course, I kind of, it, it's sort of lecture and lab and it, it's all kind of mushed together. Um, there are times that I'll mark something and be like, this is your lab. Like when we would do in-person and, and use visible body, there are times that they do a visible body lab and I'm like, this is your lab for this week. Um, just to, to be clear with them on that. But I like to keep everything in one place because I think the more different places they have to go to, the more difficulty they're going to have. So um, I just kind of like to put it all in there and then in parentheses write lab activity. And I, that, I haven't had too much of a problem with that. Um, and it also kind of shows them the lab and the lecture fit, which is sometimes a problem with students. I think sometimes they feel like, like the two are completely separate entities. But I mean, that said, if you wanted to do it separate, you could. It's not that hard to set up a different course. I just think um, from a student perspective, it'd be difficult to get them to do more than, more than one thing. The and reason I'm asking, because in regard to the physiology, do you have any specific um, a lab uh, work for the physiology, for example, muscle physi physiology or other physiology parts? Yeah, so for sure. I mean, in person, we definitely do. We definitely do. Um, I have a series of labs. Um, we've got the lab tutor system, so um, which now uses a cloud service, and I just, I can't, 
I can't require my students to buy that. So I'm creating um, a way to use their system to do like muscle recordings and that sort of stuff. So we definitely do physiology labs. Um, I have over the years created some simulations that they can do too. And some of those are outside of visible body, but I try to use free resources because I don't want them to pay for anything. So, um, so I have some of those that are helpful. I, I was going to say something and I can't remember what it was. Sorry, my brain flatlined. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely, uh, you know, do have labs. And the nice thing about the way courseware is set up is if you've got, like, say you've got a handout that you want the students to have, you can put anything you want in courseware. You can link to outside stuff. You can put in your own handouts into your course. So it's not just locked to their stuff. And I feel like a lot of the um, websites or a lot of the systems get like, if you're in McGraw-Hill, right, you're just like locked to McGraw-Hill and you can't do anything else. <laughs> this system, you can actually put your own things in and then I just number them. And so my students will know, oh, okay, this is, this is the simulation we're doing, or this is whatever. And it, they have one site to navigate. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, uh, Levi has his hand raised. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. For sure. Levi? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Hi. Uh, Thanks so much for fielding our questions. And it just so happens that I had a question about the lab manuals that you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I was actually impressed by the quality of the images and the content. One thing that I am worried about with my students is their workflow. So we've got all this new technology, especially having to go online. And I'm just imagining myself in my student's position where I assign this PDF lab uh, report for them to read over and then fill out. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of an elegant solution for getting that information back so that I can check it, grade it, and all of that stuff, other than students either printing it, taking a photo and uploading it, or finding some sort of um, PDF editor and then re-uploading that some way. As a teacher, uh, has have any of you found a way that's more elegant than that or streamlined, or is there something in courseware that can uh, help with that? So in courseware, they do have pre-lab and post-lab quizzes, and those are based on that content. So you can do it there. You can also put in short answers. And one thing I've done is sort of like a hybrid type situation where it's like, okay, do this handout, do the, the big one. And here's what I want you to do for me that's your grade. And it summarizes it, and sometimes it sends me a screenshot to show me you found this structure, you know. Um, just to get a sense that they that they did go through it. Um, I definitely, I hit a point, it was right around when we hit the digestion unit, where I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do the auto-graded post-lab post quiz because I'm going crazy here. <laughs> I need to take something <laughs> off my plate. And, you know, it worked really well. So um, I, I, I think that that it's not the ideal solution. I don't know that we have an ideal solution now, but it's good. Um, and I would definitely say that it's, it's at least, it's, it's a good workaround and the quizzes are already in there. So it's sort of a low effort workaround for you. Um, and then, you know, making your own handout that's kind of based on the last part of all these labs is called um, student practice. You could base it on that and just be like, just send me the student practice part. And at least then it's not a 40 page scan, right? Because the scans are so bad. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, oh, sorry to interrupt, Cindy. Oh, no, um, um, this is like very new news that we're working on. So I'm showing you one of the lab manuals that I think you were asking about. Um, and that these are, Cindy just said, that we do have quizzes that are based on these pre-lab exercises. We have an entire quiz bank I can show you as well, but um, we are digitizing these PDFs so that you'll be able to assign them and students can actually work on them electronically and submit them, submit them electronically so they don't have, they won't have to print them out. Cool. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's in the works right now, coming, um, I don't know if I want to say very soon, but soon. 
So we'll keep okay. you posted on that. And there are tons of them. These, there's, you know, yeah, there are. I was super excited. I know this sounds silly, but when you get to reproductive, I'm always like, what lab am I going to do for reproductive? Like I'm a little limited, right? And I don't want to end up in HR. So I was, I, I've been really excited that there's, there's a reproductive set. And I find that really helpful. And it also hits at the end of the semester when the students are kind of done and they, you know, just want to work on their own terms. And I'm like, okay, here you go. Um, and that's even when we're in person, they, they do the reproduction, reproduction lab on their own. And these are all on our website. Um, and again, we're going to digitize them. They can be um, inserted right into your course or course. Uh, but you can go online right now and just check them out anytime. So just visiblebody.com. They're under resources. Looks like Great. Dave has a question about the lab. So I'm going to, um, David, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, the PDFs that you just mentioned that the students would be able to fill them in electronically. Um, similar to a question that was asked earlier uh, where we might not cover all of the material, uh, for example, that would that would be present, are we going to have the option to maybe customize those PDFs or is it going to be pretty static? And if there is material in there that we don't require our students to know, we'll just have to let our students uh, or, or make them aware that don't worry about section five or six or whatever the case it is. Sure, I will get, I don't know the answer to that question, but I will, I will get it for you, for sure. I will say for the, um, the guided notes, um, that's all, that's all a Word document, so you can edit, edit at will. Um, and I think there's even like a sample syllabus there that's, it's a Word document. Um, I mean, the one thing you can do with the labs, of course, is just be like, oh, don't do part A. <laughs> and I've done that. You know, I'll admit sometimes that there's a little more detail there than, um, than my students are going to do. And we do have lab courses already built in courseware as well. Like I said, we've got correlations to current published lab manuals, and then we have some courses that are built to follow a, a typical A&P lab. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions about um, different programs and how they compare. Um, Anatomage, uh, Complete Anatomy, um, 3D for Medical. I'm sure Emily and I would have some answers for that. However, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and let Cindy weigh in oh, okay. on that and see if she can, um, I don't know what experience you have with the other one, Cindy, but if do you want to take what you can? <laughs> I can take what I can. So, um, I, I will admit it's been a bit since I've looked at them. Um, I only have eyes for you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I will say like 3D for medical, um, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not the biggest fan. Their, their, their illustration's gorgeous. There's, I mean, no, there, nothing about that. But I feel like once I get in there, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to use it. And I feel like leading students through would be difficult. And then they're like, oh, we have lectures. But I look at the lectures they have and I'm just, it, it just didn't fit me. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I feel like the others were kind of a similar way where I just didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I felt like, well, this would be great if I was giving patient information, but for teaching, I really need the student to be able to, you know, log in and just bam, 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 go down that checklist and make sure that they've got everything done. And if they can't do that, then it's less useful to me. Um, so, and I, you know, those also don't contain the physiology component, which was really important to me because it's, you know, I'm not just an anatomy course, I do anatomy and physiology. And that and is very, 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 very important to me. Um, we always wanna work in as much physiology as we can. So I don't know what you guys have to say about the difference. That's, that's like my little take on it. Yeah, I think that that's the biggest one that we hear as well, that it's um, e an ease of use thing. Um, that it's, there's a lot of capability, but 
students don't necessarily know what to do when they're in the other platforms. And we really spend a lot of time developing these products to be extremely intuitive, you know, like an Apple product where you, you know, you open an iPhone, you kind of just know what you're supposed to do with it. Um, and like Cindy was describing the anatomy and physiology app, that is really like the, what a lot of professors use because it is guided, you know, the student gets on the page, they've got a lesson plan. Um, the model is already dissected and ready to study, you know, and they've got the terms on the left. So they don't have to, you know, there are parts where they can go in and explore, but they don't have to, they've got the terms on the left, guiding them right to what they have to study. So that I feel like your, your student that's going to do the bare minimum, they're not going to do anything they're not told to do will do very well with this. <laughs> um, and I'll, my, my son is five, and he calls it the muscle and bone game. And he likes it because he can just kind of click through it, um, which is sometimes, you know, annoying when I'm trying to work. And I'm like, no, I need it. I, I need it on bones. Okay, I need to look at that. Well, let's look at the teeth, you know. And it's been very intuitive for him. So, um, you know, no worries in that department. Um, just to weigh in, someone had asked about the um, anatomage. I think that's that's actually a table that you would have to have, oh. have to have access to. So, in this environment of um, COVID, and I don't know about all campuses, but I think most campuses are currently closed. Um, the nice thing about courseware is that you know your students can access it from any computer. Um, you know, that has internet connection. And then as well, you also get the mobile download. So, you know, you don't have to worry about your students being, you know, physically on campus in order to access the resources, which I think is right now a big plus. Well, one thing we did, because those anatomage tables, they're expensive. And one thing we did um, is we managed to get this like massive touchscreen monitor from our, our IT department. And we have that in the hallway and it has the apps on it and it's there as like a live display basically so that um, anybody can play with the apps and you'd be surprised they're doing something different every day and and looking at different structures and they can write on it so sometimes they'll write questions and um, we have this goal for structure of the month where we'll talk about you know oh February's heart month so everything's gonna be about the heart or whatever and it's it's a nice way of getting anatomy to be less terrifying to a lot of people. Um, so that's that's my cheapy anatomage table, but I love it. Thank you. Um, Jill had a question. Jill, I'm going to see if I can find your name in this list to unmute you so you can chat with. Okay, you are now unmuted, Jill, if you want to ask your question from the Hi, how Hi, how are you? Good. Good, thank you. I had a, um, a question. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's having to put a traditionally online anatomy course forever and ever, uh, excuse me, on ground anatomy course online. Um, and it sounds like you have been incorporating visible body into um, even your on ground labs. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, concern about time management, I guess, in the sense that, like, typically in summer, you know, we have students who come to, to campus for six weeks, and we meet for three to four hours a night, and um, I'm just wondering in terms of attention span, and how much of time would be spent with them, guiding them through some of these exercises, versus how much of it do they do on their own? And um, if you've been doing it online, which I assume you have probably like the rest of us for the end of the semester, um, did you incorporate it into any of your asynchronous type recordings? I, I did, I did. So what I did um, with my course is I set it up so that they'd have to do a couple things in visible body and then they'd have a video and the video would be me talking about the anatomy and physiology of the structures. And I did a bunch of short videos because for me that was the easiest to shoot, right? So I do maybe four sub 10 minute videos. And that would be my normal, usually a module for me is about three lectures. 
So that'd be my normal three lectures um, down into distilled. It's amazing when you take out the ums though, <laughs> the dramatic pauses, they do get shorter. And then what we would do when the students would meet with me is we do like a recitation. So I had the best students in the world this semester and they'd come in and they'd be like, okay, Dr. Harley, we don't understand how the kidneys and or how, they, how the nephron filters. And I'd be like, okay, let's just do this thing. And we'd walk through it. And we did that um, in two one hour sessions a week. And then before an exam, I'd always throw an extra session in. Um, and I just would digital whiteboard with them and talk about this is, you know, the microanatomy of the nephron. This is how it's doing these things. And this is why. And okay, let's, let's throw a wrench in the situation. Let's think about diabetes. And why does diabetes muck the whole system up? And we'd kind of walk through that. Um, and I feel like that worked really, really, really well. My class would normally be two one hour, 15 minute lectures and one two hour lab. So about four and a half hours of contact time. And I kind of split it to the two one hour sort of review sessions. If they had nothing to talk about, we could go half an hour. I didn't care, you know, um, but normally they would, they would hound me and that was great. Um, and then uh, the rest of it was sort of through physical body. So really what it took the place of for me was that lab time. And then we would do some talking about, okay, well, you know, why did this happen in the lab when we would talk? So, um, which is a follow up because uh, I'm sorry, I'm very new to all of this. Um, again, we all uh, are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, true. Um, so, our, our lab was a traditional dissection um, format. Um, we use cat cadavers. So, um, sounds like you don't do that on ground. Is, is that correct? Or is this something that augments? And, and we, we don't use cadavers, no. I don't have okay. space for cadavers. So what I do that you're gonna laugh, I go to a butcher, I have a fantastic butcher here. I'm in Minnesota. So getting you know organs when you're dealing with people that break down deer and whatnot is not hard. And so when we're doing hearts, I just get a bunch of fresh hearts from the butcher. And when we're doing eyeballs, I get eyeballs. And when we're doing whatever it happens to be, I, I basically like slip the butcher some money and get, get organs. Um, and it, it works really well for me. And then what the students can do is they can use visible body with the dissection to help guide it. And they really like that that they can kind of like use those things together. So, cause you know, sometimes when you're dissecting, it doesn't look right. And it was very important to me um, for a multitude of reasons, I didn't want to use fixed tissue. So using the stuff from the butcher is great. Um, but especially with fixed tissue, I feel like it doesn't quite look right. It doesn't quite feel right. And so sometimes you can miss things. And so they can really use the two next to each other. So if you were to walk into my anatomy lab, I've got a computer at every station and the students will pull up visible body and they'll be doing it concurrent, which is really, really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love that. And, um, you know, it's kind of led me to not believe we need cadavers. I'd say the downside is that you don't get the variability that you would have if you have cadavers. And so then you kind of have to add that in periodically and say, oh, well, guess what? You know, there's variation in structures. Like, why would this be here? And um, I usually add that in as like a um, sort of a thought question. And every now and then it happens because we do the fresh organ dissections. We ended up with a backward heart and that was really exciting. And so every now and then you end up with something unique and then you say, okay, guess what? This happens. It's like one in 100,000, but it happens. And um, we work through that. So it, it can be useful even if you're in person. Um, I have a hard time saying anything is a substitute for in-person. I don't want to give up my in-person, but I think for a hybrid, I think, I think that's what we're looking at here. And I think you could make one heck of a hybrid because they would come in to your dissection already having dissected the structure digitally. So for them to get through the, what they're actually physically doing is, is not, not nearly as hard or cumbersome because they already know what they're going to do. 
Did, did that kind of make sense? Yeah, that sounds great. And can I just one clarification before mm -hmm. I go? Um, so for your entire course, the only requirement that the students have is to purchase this program. They don't have a lab manual. They don't have a, a, a textbook, no yeah. dissection kit, nothing. Yeah, and it's, you know, honestly, um, so at my institution, the students, we've got 60% Pell eligible, a lot of them are adults, returning learners, they have kids. So it was really important to me to reduce cost to allow them all to have access. And the thing I found when I had an expensive textbook is a lot of my students would fail because they didn't buy the book. And that's kind of heartbreaking, right? And so I really wanted to bring that, that cost down and that's why they literally just have to buy the app. And we even have ways for their aid to cover the software. Um, so if there's a student that couldn't afford it out of pocket, they're okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'm not sure if we missed anyone from the, ch the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and make a quick run through there. If you do have questions, though, please um, raise your hand. Um, it looks like a couple of you still have your hands raised. So if you have a follow-up question, go ahead. I think you're, you still should be unmuted. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Heather, I'm gonna unmute you now so you can ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you for this. It's been very informative. You're a very inspiring teacher. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I am curious, what kind of equipment do you use to, when you are in the classroom with the students, do you pull it up on the, on like on a browser to display on a screen somewhere? Or how do you do that? Great question. So, um, I, my, my, my university gives us professional development funds and I lobbied to be able to use them to buy an iPad. And what I do is I have it on my iPad and I plug my iPad into my computer. And that allows me to project from the iPad. They can see anything on there. I can write on it. Um, I can also move to like a note taking program and do like flow charts and stuff. And then um, while I'm doing that, I actually record my voice and I record anything that's written on the whiteboard as well. So the students are the ones that can't make it to class for whatever reason you you don't miss i mean you miss the chance to be able to ask questions in person but the goal was to get them to not feel like they're missing a lot or my heart goes out to language learners um they can watch it again if they need to to kind of understand because i can't imagine taking a science class as a language learner um it'd be really difficult so that's usually what i do um you could work it from a desktop. My feeling is that would probably be a little clunky. I, I like the iPad interface the best. Um, so I have the easiest time with it. The, the problem that I have is I'm tethered and then I can't like move around as much. And so usually what we'll do is we'll spend part of the time on the iPad walking through the structures and then part of the time on the whiteboard and then I get to move around. Right now with COVID, that doesn't matter so much. So um, instead what I would do I have behind me a green screen and so I green screen and I put the structures behind me and go full Vanna White with them which is a lot of fun <laughs> um, and I think this thing was I don't know like $16 on Amazon <laughs> so. we have to do an, a webinar with you showing uh, professors how you do that it's, it's fun. It's, it's really, really, really fun. And it started when I was utterly heartbroken about the move online because this is not what I signed up for. It was not something like I, I love being around people and it, it broke my heart. And I just, I, I felt that so strongly and I was like, I need to channel this into something. And I said, well, I'm just going to get a green screen and I'm going to like channel it into making the craziest videos I can. So urinary, I jump out of a toilet. <laughs> it, it, they're, they're all, it, it's, it's wacky, but it was a way for me to kind of work through a lot of emotion um, that was very positive and the students got a kick out of it. Um, 
and didn't, you know, scoff at the fact that the liver, the liver video involved me drinking wine while I was talking about the toxicity, <laughs> how liver deals with toxins. <laughs> um, they liked the wackiness. So, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if you want to get really crazy with like video recording, it's kind of cool to be able to use like a green screen and do some projection and get in there, but you don't have to get that fancy, right? That's like, that's like next level. Um, I think just even if you're in the corner and you're talking and you've got the rest of your recording as you walking the students through a model and pointing out structures and talking about it, I think that that helps them. And, and sometimes I don't even put me in the video. Sometimes I want to be in my pajamas all day. And then it's just, you know, the anatomical structures speaking for themselves. Um, but it, it really helps them. Um, I, I'm hoping I'm not losing anything in the chat. There's a lot in here. I'm trying to scroll back. I think some of it was covered in other questions, but if you have specific questions, please do um, raise your hand so we can call on you and get your questions answered. It looks like Sophia might have another question. You should stay. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I unmuted myself. I think it's more to a uh, question is for Emily. She mentioned LMS integration or ways to transfer grades from, you know, from courseware to Moodle. We use Moodle. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a guide or maybe demo or some video that I can use to learn how to do that? It's super easy. I'm going to show you right now. And um, we do offer complete training and support. So if you adopt Visible Body, we will set you up with a one on one hands on training with our, our dedicated trainer. Um, so definitely, like, we're, we're here to help. But basically, um, you would go into the grade book and then up in the right, it says export CSV. And here you can export it to whatever LMS compatible CSV you need. Okay, so I'll get the CSV file and then uh, in Moodle, I would upload that file and- the Yeah, there'll be grade some grade. menu that's like import. Yeah. And you just import grade. Import it, okay. yeah. I always just type it in because I'm, I'm like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I don't know how many uh, grades will be there. And I can see that two places will be confusing for students and, and like, uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm can, trying to. <laughs> it can be a lot. I think uploading can be a lot. And one thing I did, it was important to me to give the students multiple chances to do things. I wanted to make it more competency based. Um, so the way I set up my quizzes is it was a pool of like 25 questions and they get asked four of them and they get, you know, three tries or something and I take the best, the best score. And I felt like that was a really good way of, um, sort of just dealing with the scenario and dealing with the pressure that they're under right now. I love the dissection quizzes. We didn't even talk about those, but yeah. rather than asking multiple choice, you can do short answer quizzes, which you have to grade yourself. Um, multiple choice, auto-graded, yay. Um, and then you can do dissection quizzes. And the dissection quizzes are super cool because you can say, find this structure. Or when I was writing my final exam, I was like, how do I give an online exam, right? So what I did is I wrote questions that were, some of them were find me, the um, part of the intestine that's involved in electrolyte reabsorption and water reabsorption, or find me, you know, and then they get the whole digestive system and they have to find this thing, right? And there's something kind of cool about that um, where they have to, they have to kind of know what they're looking for. Um, so I was super happy to do that. And making quizzes is pretty uh, easy. And the follow up on your format, picking four questions out of 25, that's, that's part of courseware or that's your LMS 
you you can pick it in courseware. Yep, in so the courseware. You can okay. set up your courseware quizzes as a pool, and then you just have it pick okay. a certain number within the pool. Um, and uh, you can do you can have a randomized order if you're worried about you know cheating or whatever. Um, that can help a little bit. The pools help, right? Because then everything's a little bit different. Um, and then one thing you can do is you can click on the student's answer. So I had one and it was a question about the circle of Willis and I didn't, I, I wrote the question and I didn't click all the vessels of the circle of Willis. And so I had some students that were like, I clicked on a vessel of it. And when you click on the student's name, it'll tell you how they answered the question. And then I could say, oh, okay, yeah, they get a point back, you know? <laughs> um, so it's, it's in there too. And that was a concern of mine is I'm like, well, what if they weren't really wrong or at least not, comp there, there are different levels of wrong, right? <laughs> um, so it, it was nice to be able to kind of look at it and say, oh, I didn't say vein in that question and I was only expecting answers for the vein. Okay, I can, I can do that. Um, and then writing, uh, Emily's writing her own question right now. It's actually really easy. And then you've got your own bank of your questions and you can also pull from their questions. And I do a bit of both. Sometimes I'm like, I don't wanna write a question and here's this really great one. And sometimes I look at it and I say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write the question that I wanna write and I'm gonna you know, make them really think here. And and you know tailor it to to what I teach. So um, I am creating my own question, and like Cindy was talking about, sometimes the student gets very close to the structure. Um, you can so you know if you want to make these questions uh, a little bit more general, you can do that. So you have a lot of control here. So I I basically have asked my question here. I've picked a view. And then here is where you select the correct answer, what the system will accept as a correct answer. So you could select all of these. You know, this, it's gonna give you all the hierarchy of structures. It's very comprehensive, so it's all there. Most of it's, it should be, all be there. And um, you basically have control of like how difficult and or, you know, if you're okay with them getting any part of the hepatic duct, you can set the system to accept that any of these as the correct answer. Yeah, I had, I had some goofy ones. I was like, find an anastomosis. Find a, <laughs> a, a, a circumflex vessel. And, you know, it had like varying things from all over the body that they could find. And it was, it was really nice. Um, so you, you get a lot of flexibility and you can kind of have some fun with it. Um, and, it tells this, you can set it up so it tells the students the right answer right after they take it. So maybe they're, or it'll tell them that they're wrong. Um, so that they can kind of be like, oh, duh. And you don't have to do it that way. Like for an exam, I did not do that. But for the, the sort of weekly, like we're going to have a quiz on this structure, I wanted them to know where they didn't understand. That was really, really, really important to me. And here I'm just showing one of the dissection quizzes. Um, so these are auto graded quizzes though. Cindy was referring to these a few minutes ago. Um, we have a huge quiz bank. Um, again, you can use our quizzes. You can modify them by, you know, pooling and randomizing and taking questions out. You can create your own and add them in. You can mix and mass, match questions. So it's highly customizable and it's also very easy. So if you wanna use uh, content right out of the box, we have that all created for you. But um, these dissection quizzes have students working hands-on with a model. And you can see here, there are manipulation tools. So, you know, a, a lot of these quizzes, um, they do have to dissect to locate the structure. So they're working hands-on. And that's one of my quizzes. favorite things because you're, you're now saying, okay, dissect down to it. Like, I'm not gonna give you a picture that happens to have this in it, you have to find it. Right. And it's so much more genuine. You still can't do the whole body. That's one of my goals. You have to like make some compromises, but. It's coming, <laughs> that's another thing. That should be in place, I think, sometime this summer. 
Where this is the thing I love too, is that yeah. every time I say, I really want this, like it's coming. <laughs> and it's, it's always something new and it's pushing that envelope. And I feel like this as an instructor has really freed me to, to push the envelope and really um, kind of, you know, get weird with it. Um, our enrollments in A&P have increased. So the first year I taught it, I think I had like nine students one semester and 12 the other. And now we're up to, we have over, I think over a hundred in a p one and over a hundred in a p two every year. So we've grown by leaps and bounds. Um, it's at least 75. So, I mean, you can imagine that kind of growth. My, my Dean is very happy with me. So, um, and I attribute a lot of that to students having this positive experience of having materials that they, they can relate to and, and basically wrote to succeed, right? These kids grew up with computers. They grew up with devices. So this is kind of their language. And, you know, we can be afraid of technology or we can embrace it and use it and figure out how to help it benefit us as educators. Right. Any other questions? Please feel free to raise your hand. Sophia, you're um, you go ahead and ask another question. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, before uh, the, the webinar ends, I'm just wondering, is there some sort of community or list, you know, like mail list or group of, uh, you know, people like us here, for example, that are connected and, and talk to each other? regularly. I know we can contact everyone from visible body, uh, but uh, do you think there is some place where we can, uh, you know, interact in, in some way? Um, I always talk with anybody who asks. <laughs> so you're, you're certainly welcome to, to email me. It's just cindy.harley at metrostate.edu. Yeah, that was um, me who emailed you. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, I was like, yeah, she found me. Um, yeah. Yeah, so certainly I'm, I'm open to talking to whoever. Um, and, and as you found, I'm, in, I'm involved in SABER too. So it's, you know, kind of in that educator community. Um, I don't think we have an educator chat yet, but what I will say is one of the, the cool things about courseware is it's really easy to share your course. And that's something that I've done um, as I've had friends go to other institutions and they're like, okay, we're going to use Visible Body. Can you please share? And I can say, yeah, here's what I do and then just send it over to them. And that's what I do, because um, now we have enough A&P students, I can't teach them all. So that's what I do with the other instructors, is I say, here's the course, you know, adapt it how you see fit, but this is what I've done. And they get everything. And it's, it's kind of neat, and it's very, very, very easy. So, big fan. <laughs> we will great. Thank you. hold these office hours, and we're planning to do them at least once a week for as long as we possibly can. Cool. So we've got, um, stay tuned, we, we have more coming. Um, so please join us, and uh, we hope to have a community section to our website, again, coming soon, but it's something we've been talking about where there'll be a forum for professors to interact. So I will pass that up the chain again. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Any chance to share materials, yeah. you know, and especially right now, I feel like any chance to share materials and share what's worked and what hasn't, that's, that's what's going to help us all through this. Yeah. And that's what's going to help us all, you know, what do we want to do? We all want to offer the best course we can. That's going to help us do it. Great. Any other questions? Uh, Clara, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, Clara, you may need to unmute yourself on your end. Okay, Clara's asking about pricing. Is it $50 for each student? Oh, okay, yeah, her speaker's not working. Oh, okay. Um, is it $50 for each student? 
So yeah, so $49.99 um, per student, that gives them access to the courseware platform for two years. Plus it gives them a mobile download of each of the apps. Um, right now there are four, soon to be five. Um, and that mobile download is theirs to keep. And one thing we've done is we've actually been um, setting it up with, so I teach primarily pre-nursing. So we've been talking to the nursing program and saying, hey, you know, when you teach pathophys, do you think you can use these apps too? And kind of trying to sort of share the, share the love and the wealth and, 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 and make these materials really, really, really valuable. So students find them valuable for a &P, um, for sure. Like they, they do not balk at the price. They actually really love it. And two years is great because if they fail, they still have access. Um, but then their subsequent courses sometimes use the materials too. And that's, that's been really cool because then they walk in, they're like, oh, I know this, but now we're in pathophys and we're using the muscle app a little bit more and looking at, you know, mobility disorders or something. And they kind of like to see uh, things, the, the reuse. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? We've got high schoolers. The high schoolers will love it. Their handouts, they can scan with their phone and it pops up the thing and then they can fill them out and they're already available for you. And they're really cool. Sometimes I use them for the A&P students. They love it. All right. If anybody has any further questions, um, you can always reach out to us after the webinar or, you know, we'll hang out for a couple of minutes if anybody wants to, you know, ask a question, feel free to just raise your hand. I'm just wondering for at the moment when you have the free trial, it's also free for students, right? It, it will be $50 after for the courseware after this period expires, right? Correct. Yeah. So okay. the trial is open to students too. You would need to send them a course um, mm -hmm. to access it. But yeah, so they would have access to the web apps. They just don't have the mobile downloads. And that trial okay. is June 30th. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. And then, I mean, for your summer course, you could even try it and just see if they like it. But I mean, in my experience, once they figure out how to use it, they love it. And I usually just do an assignment that's like, click on the speaker button. What does it do? You know, just to kind of like walk them through um, what the different capabilities of the system are. And then once they figure it out, they're, they're in it. And usually we'll push it further than you do. And sometimes they'll come to class with questions and you're like, where did you learn that? <laughs> Why? That's so detailed. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Well, that's what I'm looking for. And then I, I, I think you're absolutely right. They will be engaged much more or than, than before. Um, yeah, they, I, I love it. And I'll have students that are really interested in dental and they'll like just rock out dental anatomy and they'll have all these dental questions. I'm like, uh, I'm not sure I know the answer, but they say, well, you know, I know I'm going to have to learn it. And, and that's just their attitude. They're like, I'm going to have to learn it sometime. So I might as well learn it now. Or, you know, you'll have students that had an injury or, I mean, I've even, my husband broke his arm and he had to have a sub, subclavicular block and I totally pulled it up in the, and was showing him like, hey, this is where they're going to put the, the stuff. And, um, you know, much to the nurse's chagrin, but it was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, if anybody you know, has any follow-up questions after the fact, you're welcome to um, email any of us to get in touch. Um, and thank you for attending. We do have a recording. Um, it usually takes a little while to get it posted. I'm assuming it'll probably be up tomorrow. So. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy.
Hey, thank you. This is fun. Anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> Have a good day, everybody. Bye, everyone.